was saying. And this is why we want to be able to engage God, engage the God as I'm talking about, the, what the Lord shared with me is get connected. We've got to get connected. And again, we, we need this connection. And obviously, I do this for illustration because you know he's in here, right? right? So, but unless this connection is right and flowing properly, then this connection is not going to flow properly. So again, when I keep saying we need to make him number one, he needs to be our all in all. And, and I wasn't brought up that way. You know, my wife was supposed to be my number one. And she was, because I wasn't saved when we got married, but then even when I got saved and she got saved, that vow or whatever was still there, and all I did was put God on top of it, not understanding that vow was there until she died. And then when she died, I started dying, and when I inquired to God about that, what's going on, God? That's when he told me I didn't love him. And I'm like, I'm shocked. What do you mean I don't love you? No, no, no. Your real love, you were rooted in her. Now that she has died, you are slowly dying. And then that's what really pushed me into going after him, wanting to know his love. So the other thing I want to tell you is what, you know, the prophetic word we had. I, I got that up on the website separately. If you've noticed, you follow on the website to get the notes for today. It's there separately. That God, when he's doing a reconstruction, it's not to destroy, but to establish. God wants to establish things in our lives, corporately, and kingdom-wise. But there's things that got to get tore down in order for other things to get rebuilt. And what's the best thing is if we lay it down, like we saw this morning... We get rid of the old wine so we can have room for new wine. We lay down the old flame so we can get a new flame. You know, we put ourselves out on the altar as a living sacrifice. Because we're struggling to do things in the natural and not understanding why it's not working. And, and we'll kind of get to that a little bit this morning. So our sermon title text type of thing comes from 1 John 1, 1 through 4 in the voice translation. I really just want to kind of look at the highlighted piece in verse 3 because I already mentioned this last week. It says, what we saw and heard we pass on to you. Can you turn the monitors down a little bit or whatever? I hear myself popping. Can you hear me popping? Okay. That's better. Thank you. Um, it says, what we have saw and heard, we pass on to you, so that you too will be connected with us intimately and become family. That's what this is about, an intimate connection and becoming family. Kingdom family, kingdom citizens. But it comes to an intimacy of connection. See, we think because we said a prayer, we're in. We're in the family and we're connected with others, but we understand from a natural perspective, we have different types of relationships with different types of people. Not everybody's family. You know, we have family by blood and we get probably some closer family that ain't blood because of the relationship we develop with them. So we want to understand it's the same with, with the Godhead, which we're talking about now, and then we're going to talk about the ecclesia itself, and then about individually, ourselves. The relationship occurs through intimacy, getting to know one another, getting to know the Godhead. Like I've been saying, you can't do that in the natural because how do you get to know somebody you can't see, taste, feel, touch, whatever? How do you do that? Well, that's why. It has to be from our spirit. That's what we're talking about. How do we actually engage as a spirit being, spirit beings, to put it that way. So the verse goes on and says, Our family is united by our connection with the Father and His Son, the Anointed One. So we understand this connection has to flow out of that connection from what he's saying. So the focus has to be this connection, not these connections first. This connection first. Can't even be this connection first. It has to be that connection first. You know, we had a conversation driving to the doctors this weekend, 
I even brought that up with her again. I don't know why. You cannot be my number one. You can't be. He has to be. The Godhead has to be my number one. And when I truly make that my number one, then this is going to be so awesome. So my focus needs to be there so that that can flow out into that. And then into this. And into the whole thing. And then into the kingdom. And that's why I think we miss it a lot. Because we do not focus as much as we should on that divine connection. I'll say it that way. So, next slide if you would. So we want to get connected. And last week we talked about the Father. This week I want to talk about the Son. But I want to connect with the Son in a way of Lordship. Just like we could connect with the Father, as I'm going to read here, that he is a farmer. He's a vineyard ten, uh, tender. So we could connect with him as a farmer. We could connect with him as the creator. No, no, no. Last week he was our father. He was dad. I want to connect with him that way. Because again, as I said, some of our relationships with dads weren't the best. Some might not even have known dad. Some might have had a bad dad. Some might have had an okay dad. And we tend to project that onto God the Father. So, again, we dealt with all that last week, and I'm going to redo all that. So this week we want to deal with the Son, but I want to deal with Him not as Savior, not as Healer, not as Redeemer, but as Lord. Because I believe if we make Him Lord, all those things are underneath it, and all that comes with the Lordship. So the most important thing with the Father, I believe, was Daddy. With the Son, I believe, is Lord. So, in John 15, if you're following along, this is in the Passion Translation, starting in verse 1, it says, I am a true sprouting vine, and the Father who tends the vine is, the Father who tends the vine is my Father. So Jesus is letting us know right off, I'm sure you've read this a bunch, heard a bunch of messages on this. So again, don't zone now. Because you don't need information. you got information. You need revelation. Okay? You don't need information. Well, I've heard this before. How many times do we do that? Yeah, I've heard that story before. And we just kind of zone out. And we go back to thinking what we got to do later. Don't worry. It will be there. <laughs> but you know what? You may miss a revelation that will help you get through what's out there later. Amen. So again, it doesn't do any good to focus on later right now. It will still be there. You want to focus on this and what the Spirit of God wants you to get this morning, which will be different for everybody. So in verse 2, he says, He cares for the branches connected to me by lifting and propping up the fruitless branches and pruning every uh, fruitful branch to yield a greater harvest. <coughs> okay, so get the picture. Jesus is painting a picture for us. He's a vine. His father is the vine keeper. And he says, the, father, the farmer goes out and he prunes, lifts up, basically encourages fruitful growth. Okay? So some of you need that revelation. So when stuff's going on in your life, it's not to destroy but to establish fruitful growth. And sometimes you've got to hack off some old stuff because it's no longer any good. It didn't mean it was bad. It's time has ended. Not producing. There you go. It's not producing anymore. But the problem is something that's not producing will suck the life out of something that wants to produce life. So you need to be careful. So the Father knows all that. So here Jesus is giving us that story, giving us that illustration. Now verse 3 he says, the words I have spoken over you have already cleansed you. Catch this revelation. You've been cleansed, but that doesn't mean you're fruitful still. Okay, I've cleansed you. I've cleaned you. So now you can begin to produce. So catch that. Because the thing that keeps, I don't want to use the word haunting, but I guess I will is all the old dogma, all the old religious, doctrinal, theology junk I've learned is not true. And one of the things was, I'm a new creation, so everything's new. That's a lie. 
It's not all new. It's beginning to become new now. But there's still a process of working it out and walking it out. And he's telling us this right now. I've cleansed you. But now you get some work to do to become fruitful. So he goes on and he says, you've already been cleansed. Now look at verse 4. So you must remain in life union with me. Now remember what I said about the colors. Red's kind of important. Kind of jumps out. You need to remain in life union with me. Some versions say, like that one, abide. You've got to abide in me. You've got to be connected to me. You've got to be established in me. I like that other translation, welded together. I like that. He says, for I remain in life union with you. Okay? So now it goes on. Now the colored piece. For as a branch severed from the vine will not bear fruit. We know that. We've all seen that. To one degree or another. So your life will be fruitless unless you live your life intimately joined to mine. So he's going to remain in that union. He's going to remain faithful. But guess who can become unfaithful? Us. I can choose to disconnect. It's what he said. Because unless you stay in this intimate relationship, you're going to bear any fruit. Am I still a vine? Yeah. So think about it. You got a vine, you got a tree, you got a plant, whatever, however you want to view it. You break out a branch, or during the storm, we took a walk around the park yesterday, this huge tree was laying across the pathway. Storm took it down. You know what? That's what happens in a lot of people's lives. The storm comes and knocks them down. You know why? They weren't connected to the life. Because those trees that we saw, they were dead. One tree walked by and Robin's like, where'd that come from? And I looked up and like, that's what broke off. And she looked and says, wow. The tree looked good on the outside. It was dead on the inside. It wasn't connected to the life that it was in the roots. That's why he says, let your love grow root down deep into me. Let it root down. So that tree still looked like the tree. But it was dead. It was no longer attached. He goes on to verse 5 and says, I am the sprouting vine and you are my branches. So now we get more detailed. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Dad is the farmer. Okay. Catch the picture. And as you live in union with me as your source. Oh, he got pretty blunt right there. As you live in union with me, how? As your source. Connected to the vine so that the sap may flow, the life may flow into your branch. But when you live separated from me, you're powerless. So when you choose not to have that intimate relationship, because again, like I was saying earlier, we have degrees of relationship that we have with people. A lot of people have that same kind of degree of relationship with the Lord. And I'll, I'll get into that more in verse 7. But notice verse 6, it says, If a person is separated from me, I don't like what that green piece says right there. What does it say? Some of you get your notes there. What does it say? He is discarded. He's discarded. Such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire to be burned. That's nasty. And I'll put on the compost to be used again. No, when the branches are broke off, cut off, pruned, or whatever, they're no good anymore. Now they get thrown in the fire to be burned up. Now look at verse 7. This is Hopefully we can catch this revelation that the Lord was putting on my heart this morning when I was going over this again. Verse 7, it says, But if you live in a life union with me, 
And if my word, see the way that's bracketed? The little bump on it? I don't know what you call that. Um, that's the explanation that the Passion Translation gives. So when Jesus is talking here about my words, he's talking about a rhema word. Not the Logos word. The rhema word. So he says, if my words, the rhema word, live powerfully within you, now see just the parenthesis, that is my addition. They live powerfully in you when you have a revelation of the rhema word. Now at the risk of being misunderstood, I'm still going to say this anyway. I don't think a lot of times people understand the difference between the Logos word and the rhema word. Do you know what the difference is? Because I'm going to explain it to you. The Logos word is this. Can I say something at the risk of being misunderstood and have one of these thrown at me? Not by you guys, but you love me. You won't misunderstand it. But someone's going to throw it at the camera when they are watching this later. We have made an idol out of this. We have wanted to fight about it, argue over it. Do you understand this has already been spoken? That's why people clearly say there's no new truth. No, there isn't. It's been spoken. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about him speaking to me and me gaining a revelation of that. See, we want to read this, fight about it, set up doctrine over it, and totally discard any kind of rainbow word that comes. This is an old word. Rainbow word is a new word. It's not new truth. It's a new word that brings new revelation for us to walk in. Now, how many of you ever heard this is God's love letter to us? Right? This is God's love letter to us. Now, think about this. Back in the old days, I don't want to call Richard old, but he's a little older than me. Back in the older days, Much older. communication used to be done by letters. You know, especially those in the military, you know. That girl over there understands that. You know, so when your husband, all wife, well back then it wasn't the wise, was in the military, the only way you were able to develop intimacy or communication with the person was writing a letter. Got mail, got to them, and they get all excited, read it, they wrote back, and what we call them are love letters. We even do it one another. We write love letters when we start to get to know somebody, right? Introducing ourselves, getting to know one another. Is intimacy ever developed out of a love letter? No. How does intimacy get developed in the natural? Face to face. Touching, engaging, embracing. That's what he's talking about here. He says, if my words, the rhema, live powerfully within you, then you can ask whatever you desire and it will be done. So again, I put these parentheses in, so this is just my comment to remind myself to say it is this. Simply having information, a love letter, without any personal revelation, will never cause anyone to change in their life. Do you know how many people can exegesis this thing through critical, whatever they called it, to death, and fight over it, and set up doctrine, and set up dogma, and set up laws, and rules, and regulations, never have an intimate relationship with God. Now again, please don't misunderstand. This will not develop you a clear, deep, intimate relationship with God. This will introduce you to God. Guide you in the things of God. 
We use this, yes, when we hear from God, okay, God, is that something I can see in here? So I know it's coming from you, especially early on, when we're getting used to engaging with them. Just like when we have all these different love letters and we get, get, get used to engaging with the person in the natural, then we meet the person for real, and then all of a sudden the person says something. It's like, wait a minute, you didn't write any of that down. Where did that come from? It's the same type of thing. We can still use it as a reference point. Know what I mean? So again, it's a balance. It's two sides of the same coin. The logos and the rainbow. Now, for me personally, I was stuck on one side. I was always the logos guy. Always. I could pull that thing apart, study to show yourself and prove God. You know how you can tell when somebody's really focusing on the logos part versus the rainbow part? When you engage them, they say, well, the Bible says. <laughs> Bible says, the Bible says. The real smart ones will start quoting scripture. Well, it says here, da 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 so see, you're wrong. Well, if God's spoken to you, well, he doesn't have to speak to me, I got the book. That's when you know this is where their relationship is. Now, this is a good starting point. Absolutely. Just like writing a love letter to a person is a good starting point. But after all you ever have is love letters back and forth, or when you see them face to face and you're both sitting there writing letters, <laughs> passing them back and forth notes, you're not going to develop a deep relationship that way. Deep relationship comes through engagement, through revelation, through understanding. Uh, no, come on. <coughs> okay, so when he's there, I'll be transparent, that's okay. Oh, you guys know how perfect I am, right? <laughs> this is what he wants to share as an illustration. You can't rely on the old to go into the new. See, when I first got married with Robin, I started walking the thing out like I did with Mary. So I got this thing, been married. I know how this works. Engage him with the rain of the same way. And it's a totally different thing. That's why I want to encourage you. Don't get wigged out. Don't get all worked up. It's completely different. This is, do you understand this takes no intimacy at all to engage with? None. You don't need to be intimate with this. This is information that the Spirit can bring revelation, but it won't bring deep revelation apart from Rhema 2. It's the other side of the coin. That makes sense? You okay with that? Yeah. Get that? The good questions about that, let's talk about it later, because I only get so much time, I want to get the rest in. But that's what God was really showing me, because again, I was there. I would fight you tooth and nail about that book. And I probably still will, but I've understood there's more to it than just the book. I was making an idol of the book. No, there's more to it. There's a personal relationship he wants to develop with me that requires me engaging him in an experiential way, which I never did before. Just like people can have marriages the same way and never personally really deeply engage with one another. That's not what he wants. That's why he's used the word in here a couple times and in the other verses I read, the word intimacy, intimate. He wants to be intimate. He wants to engage us all the way down. He says, then you can ask whatever you desire and I'll be done. So people wonder, how can I keep asking? How can I keep saying, no, 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 you don't have that kind of relationship. Verse 8, when your lives bear abundant fruit, you demonstrate that you are my mature disciples who glorify my Father. See, spiritual experiences and doing stuff doesn't glorify Him. 
We demonstrate by the fruit that we bear, which is character development. Okay? If our character isn't changing, we get a problem. All right, next slide, if you would. So I'm just kind of laying the groundwork, then I'll give you a couple practical steps, and we'll do that little activation thing like we did last week, just to help. Because, like Jeff Tibbetts keeps saying, you don't know what you don't know. So if you don't know how, you don't know how, so I want to try to help you how, but how I help you with the how doesn't mean the how will work for you. You know what I mean? It's just a way of you, okay, this is how you do it, and then you'll find your own means. So we also want to understand that abiding in the vine through life-giving union is a daily choice. It's a daily choice. See, we tend to coast and take too much stuff for granted. I gotta every morning get up and love this woman. Well, don't you love her? Yeah! But it's a daily choice. A daily choice. Right? So I woke up a little ugly this morning. And it's like, okay. Was it extremely quiet right in? But she allowed that to happen because I had to get right. I kept saying, God, I can't, I can't stand before your people and bring forth the life-giving word, feeling like this in the flesh and in my soul this morning. I can't do that. I gotta be right. This ain't no joke. This ain't a job. Like people can go to work ugly and still do their job. No, this is not a job. This is life or death. This is people's lives. This is serious. Where every word that goes forth needs to be life giving. And the Spirit needs to take it and do whatever He wants to do convict, judge, whatever He wants. That's why I said if all of a sudden things stop pricking you here or there as we go through this, he's not out to destroy you. He's out to prune you, to establish you, that you will bear more fruit and bring honor and glory to him. That's what this is all about. But abiding takes a daily choice. You know where that text is. Revelation 3.20, this is in the Passion. He says, Behold, I stand at the door knocking. Not what knock. I'm knocking. If your heart is open to hear my voice, notice that. If your heart is open to hear my voice, and you open the door within, you open the door within, I will come into you and feast with you, and you will feast with me. So again, that's speaking of intimacy. That's inviting face-to-face -face conversation, personal engagement. Not by just reading a love letter, but engaging. Because this is what he wants to do with us. I'm knocking at the door. I want to come in. So what I want to do is, yeah, I want to talk about the significance. Maybe you already know the significance. I didn't. This helped me out with this. I want you to understand the significance of a door. Or the Bible calls them gates also in biblical times. Now, when we think of a door, we get a door there, we get a door there, and usually a door initially means protection, right? It keeps out what you don't want coming in. So at night, we all lock our doors. Why? We want to keep out whatever from coming in. We don't want certain things coming in. We lock up the church when we go today. We want to keep out things outside. And back then, too, the cities also had gatekeepers. They had people at the gate making sure what they didn't want in the city wasn't coming in. They were gatekeepers. And not only that, they had watchmen that sat on towers keeping an eye out for stuff. Okay, this is important. When you think about gates, you think about doors. I'm going to probably use the word gates more often than doors. <clears throat> but the illustration is with the door. But also an important thing about the city gate, it was a place where all kinds of important community activity took place. Okay? A lot of activity took place at the gate. 
So I'm just going to go quickly through a couple, three of these. Legal transactions and business were conducted there. Ruth 4, 1 through 11, Boaz met at the gate in Bethlehem and went through the situation with Ruth. He wanted her to become his wife. He had to go through the kins, uh, kinsman redeemer aspect and work all that out. So actually legal business was conducted at the gate so you could marry Ruth. And judicial business got conducted there because in the law of Moses, if you had a rebellious son, you had to bring him to the gate before the elders, examine him, and declare judgment. And then King David, before he would send his troops out, he would stand in the city gate, get the troops around, and give instructions. So proclamations were made from the gate. Okay? And announcements were made from the gate. Now keep this in mind as we're talking about this. Okay? This is relevant. It's not a filler. So Jesus made an important, powerful declaration about a gate, didn't he, in Matthew 16, 18. He said to Peter, right, on this rock I will build my ecclesia. Again, he didn't say church, he said ecclesia. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So obviously, some little ones here, hell has gates. Now if we think about gates and what we just saw, legal transactions happen. Jurisdiction happens at gates. But not only that, Remember when we talked about properly, proper biblical interpretation and going through and that law of first mention? Did you ever look at first mention of all gates? Maybe not. I did. I'll help you. It's in Genesis 19.1. First time gate was mentioned. It said, Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. And when he saw them, he rose and met them, and he bowed himself with his face towards the ground. Spiritual activity occupied gates. So, we can sum it up this way. It's more than a simple entrance point. Because that's what we think. It's a door. It's a way in and a way out. No, no, no. Think biblically, think spiritually. It was a lot more than that. They were the center of life's activity. Activity happened around a gate. It was a spot where legal, political, judicial, spiritual, and economic activity took place. A lot happened at the gate. It was the foundation on which the community was built. At the gate. So that's why Proverbs 4.23 out of the Passion Translation, this ought to open up a whole new revelation for us when it says, above all, guide the affections of your heart. Or like I put in parentheses, heart gate. And then the Passion Translation expands it with the next. It says, this includes your thoughts, our will, our discernment, and our affections. I don't want to get off on discernment. But there is such a lack of discernment today going on with people being railroaded, taken advantage of, just because they don't discern. When you get that, what we call a little check in your spirit or just a little tweak or something, don't listen to that. Don't blow it off. I'm talking from experience. Just don't blow it off. Rationalize it and say, oh, I understand why. No. Don't do that. Why? Because we get a God, the affections of the heart. Then it goes on and says, pay attention to the welfare of your innermost being. Pay attention. And then this is my wording here. The gates where spiritual activity take place, take attention. Pay attention. For from there flows the wellsprings of life. So throw up the next slide, if you would, please. I want you to picture yourself as that guy over there. And I don't know if you can see it real well, but there's a padlock there. Guess who's on the other side? Jesus. 
Let me ask you, who is sitting in the love gate of your heart? Because the elders, the officials, the prominent people sat at the gate. Who's sitting at your gate? Conducting the business of your life. Because Revelation 2, 4, and 5, very familiar, we've all heard it numerous times. Passion Translation says this, but I have this against you. You have abandoned the passionate love you had for me at the beginning. You've abandoned it. You're no longer drawing source from the vine. You've broken yourself off, so go off and do your own thing the way you want to do it, because what we do as people say, God, I got this one. I know what your word says about this one, and we just go plowing forward and wonder why there was no harvest reaped out of that, nothing got produced out of that. But yeah, I know what your word said, God. It says, if I declare and I demand and I jump up and down and scream, it will be done to me. And I didn't say that. You stay intimately connected to me and draw your source from me. That's why last week we talked about trust was so important. You've got to believe, know that you know that you know what God says will happen. You've got to believe it. You've got to declare it. You've got to see it. Because Jesus can only do what he saw the Father doing. Look at verse 5. It says, and how far you have fallen. The next word is in red, ain't it? What's it say? Repent. <laughs> now the way we've learned repent, this is the passion's explanation of the word repent, and I like this, because we've always heard it means turn around, change your mind, right? Go in a different direction. It's a little bit more to it than that. So it gives the word there. It says, means more than simply changing one's mind. Because that's what we heard, change your mind. Let me ask you a question. If you change your mind, do you have a tendency to change back? Sometimes. Last week I said, I'm not eating these little cookie things anymore. <laughs> because we got like a case of, let me come in at 16. I think I ate 14 of them. <laughs> you know how we say we need comfort food at times? Last Sunday I needed some comfort food. <laughs> and I like OD on wasn't too comfortable on Monday. <laughs> Nor on Tuesday. So I said, remind me to never get these again. What did we do yesterday? <laughs> Bought them again. <laughs> I said, I am limiting myself to three a day. I mean, I eat yesterday. Six. Six? <laughs> no, I had four. You had two. Y'all do not count. <laughs> but see, when we change our, we can change our mind back. I said last week, no more. This week, you can. <laughs> see, but that's what we do. That's why repentance is a little bit more than just change your mind. Because we can have a tendency over time to change it back. So the Greek word literally means to take another mind. Ooh. It says every believer needs to turn from his or her error and take another mind, the mind of Christ. So I thought it was like this, because I, you know, I do electronics and think about computers and stuff. So the illustration I got when I thought of this, it's like, okay, take out that RAM. Sometimes it comes on a little card. So remove that card, which has the old stinking thinking on it, and take Jesus' card and put it in its place. <laughs> remove the old and replace it with the new. Now the new is programmed differently. So I can't even go back to thinking the way it was before because it's a new program. New memory. Because I literally removed 
the old. I didn't just change my mind. I removed it in that area of my life for that particular thing. See, we think, okay, I got the mind of Christ. No, you don't. You still think like you always thought. Well, I'm going to claim it. Okay, well, your life ain't displaying it. It's not like a massive overhaul. Take out chips one at a time. As the Spirit brings it to you. Okay, we're going to deal with this one now. Okay. You need a new piece of your mind right there. Okay. Holy Spirit, give me a new ram. Boop. Put it in. Take out the old one. That's what repent means. See, it's... <laughs> this is funny. You just gave me this illustration. See, when we get saved, it was like a factory reset. But some of the old stuff was still there. We just didn't access it. And then as we start walking in life, we start accessing some of the old program. No, we don't just need a factory reset. It's the start. See, when you reload software, you do a format on the disk. Okay. But you've got to make sure you don't put the old stuff back in. And then we try to put new stuff, but the old stuff makes a hybrid, and that makes a huge mess. So no. As we repent, let him replace that. Don't allow the old program to go back. Then it goes on. Up oh, where'd I go? He says, and do the works of love, you did it first. I will come to you and remove your candlestick from its place of influence if you don't repent. I'm going to remove your influence if you don't repent. Why? Because he wants to hurt. No, he wants to establish. He wants you to be fruitful. He knows the old got us so far. In order to go past, that old stuff has to get pruned off. That's why I said, I don't understand, like I brought up last week, when iron sharpens iron and the sparks are flying, it's not to destroy. Swords are hidden. It's to knock off junk. And when you get done, you're sharper than before. But see, what happens is, when the adversity comes, that's why God's giving me this. We tend to run back to the former because it was comfortable and it was easy. But the former is not going to bring you into the new thing. You've got to cut off the old. Even if it's good, it doesn't matter because it's going to keep you where you're at. You know where to go forward. Okay, someone just said, well, I'm comfortable where I'm at. But if you stay where you're at, you'll eventually die. Because there'll be no new life. That will be all eaten up. Just like the plants. You don't get flowers in the garden. First frost hits, and another month or so, two months, they're going to turn around and die. They ain't coming back next year. They were good for a season. And people have been walking around dead. Even with the perennial ones we got. One of them didn't come back, did it? Came up back late. Things eventually die if they're not taken care of. God knows that. He wants to take care of us. He only has good thoughts for us. Good things for us. We have a destiny to walk it out. But in walking it out, he has to keep pruning, cutting, changing. But the problem is, sometimes we separate ourselves because we got it. We can handle it. Not understanding that we're not connected to the source anymore and we're slowly dying. So this is what I want to do with this. Is Jesus over there? Mm -hmm. That's you over there. So I want to pray like we did last week. But instead of you closing your eyes, I'm going to pray and read this and if God gives me something else to say. Cool. I want you looking at that one for me. Put yourself there, knowing he's right there. You know what I mean? You look at it. Because it's a little bit different when we engage somebody in a face-to-face -face conversation than a phone call, email, text, write a letter, whatever. 
has a little bit more meaning when you're looking at the person talking. So that's what I want to do this morning because that's what he told me he wanted us to do this morning. So I'm going to read this to you and you just look at that as I read. So, Lord Jesus, Yeshua, forgive me for my lack of intimacy with you. Forgive me each time I have separated myself from the life-giving vine by choosing to do things my own way. I don't want to be a fruitless branch, one that is cut off, pruned by the Father and thrown into the fire. Lord, I ask you to forgive me for not opening the door of my heart each time you have not. <clears throat> I've allowed my life's experiences, along with guilt and shame, to keep you out. I have projected my struggles, hurts, and pain onto you, which has kept you on the outside. For this, I ask forgiveness. Yeshua, I open the door and invite you to come in to my entire being. I ask you to take your rightful place and sit in the gate of my heart. I ask you to once again be my all in all, my first love. Lord, I know life has damaged my gates. Will you help me to repair the gate of my heart? As my gates get repaired, I ask you to administer all the activities at all my heart gate from this day forward. I once again make you my all in all, you the Lord over all my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now I want you to close your eyes. So we won't paint a picture like we did last week. Again, help us engage in the spirit, just to help us. And again, you don't have to do what I do. I'm just trying to give you an understanding of how to do. So let's engage him now. Let's close your eyes. And I want you to picture in your mind's eyes, your imagination, or however you do it, discern that Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. Right now, he's knocking. I want you to see yourself getting up, because that's what I'd be doing, sitting in the living room. Someone's knocking at the door. Get up, walk over to the door, and open it. So I want, to, I want you to see yourself walking open to the door and open it wide. Don't just peek and see who it is. No, open it all the way, wide open. And see Jesus standing there in the doorway. Now again, you may not see him. You may just discern. You might not see or feel anything. This is just practice to engage in the spirit. Now I want you to look into his eyes and notice he's smiling. Feel the warmth and compassion radiating from his presence standing there. Now, invite him in. Invite him into your heart gate. And you know, as we usually do when we invite an unexpected guest into our house, we usually say, forgive the mess, don't we? Because if we knew they were coming, we'd have cleaned up. But we usually say, forgive the mess. But instead of saying that to Jesus, I want you to say to him, Lord, Will you help me clean up this mess? Will you help me clean up this mess in my heart? Will you help me re to remove the idols and the meaningless things that are cluttering up my life? Will you heal the hurts and the scars that life has left upon me because I chose to do things my own way? 
Now notice he's still smiling. He's got a twinkle in his eye. Now notice he's starting to roll up his sleeves. He says, I've been waiting for you to ask me that for a long time. Okay, let's get to it. Because that's what he wants to do. He's not a large in. He wants to be invited in. He's not going to run away because of the mess. He knows what life does to people. He knows the hurts and the struggles and the pains and the things we go through. He's been waiting for you to ask. He's been waiting for you to say, can you help me clean this mess up? He's rolling up his sleeves and saying, let's get to it. Lord, I thank you that everything you do in our life is for our benefit. Lord, forgive us for keeping a lock on the door because we've been hurt, and that's our natural response to hurt. Keep others out because we don't trust them. We're going to keep the door locked. We're not going to be hurt anymore. I remember when I said that to you, I would not get married again because I will not endure the hurt again that I endured. But Father, that wasn't your plan for me. That was just me trying to protect my own life. I'm not supposed to protect my own life, Lord. You're my protector. You're my all in all. I need to trust in you. Knowing that you only have the best for me. So Father, forgive us for that lack of trust in you, thinking we have to do this stuff ourselves. And all you're asking is to be invited in and to work with us because you said, you'll come with me. You think that's talking about religious activity? No. You want to bring instruction. You want to clean us up. You want to make us fruitful and powerful just as you are. And the only way we can see that is by being disciplined and instructed and all that stuff that yoking up will do. Father, forgive us for the times we've ran from that yoking, from the time that we've kept the door shut, afraid of opening it, because we weren't sure what you wanted to do. Because we didn't trust you. Lord, help us to get rid of that old mindset. Help us to get rid of these things that have hindered you from coming in freely. Father, unless we clean up our heart gate, nothing else is going to be right. Everything flows out of love. Everything has to flow from that place. That's why you told us you are love. You don't just love, you are love. And you love so much that you demonstrated it. And Father, we tend to hold back our love sometimes because we've been hurt, or we're guilty, or we're ashamed, or whatever the reasons are, Father. But today, will you do a work in our hearts? And Lord, I know it's not going to get done in this moment. Father, this week that we would focus on that, that Jesus, you would come and knock on the door. That you would come and speak rainbow words. That you would give us revelation of those truths that we can walk in. That we would truly develop a relationship with you. That it would not be a stale letter writing relationship. That never becomes intimate, consummated, anything. It becomes stale and dry. It becomes about facts and knowing about and not intimately understanding and developing that kind of a relationship. So Father, this morning as we go, I thank you for your spirit speaking to us, guiding us as next week we talk about him, Father. We're only touching on things. There's a whole
whole lot more to all of this. But Lord, I know you want us to get connected, first of all, with you. That's what we're going to do, Lord. Talk about it, practice it, walk it out. Because without that, you will never impact this world for your kingdom. Nothing will ever change through stale letter writing. So Father, use us to be vibrant, intimate, cutting edge, whatever you want to call it. That truly some things will change. First in our own lives and then in the lives and atmosphere around us. Because that's your intent and will. That we will truly emulate our Lord and allow Him to do a work in our life. When He comes knocking, we're going to let Him in. Thank you for it now as we go from this place blessed and encouraged. And I pray, pray Lord, you are, you smile. Thank you, Dad. Looking down upon us, smiling this morning. Thank you, Lord, because that is our intent to worship you in spirit and truth today. Thank you, Lord, in the name of Yeshua, Hamashir, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. And as always, if you need prayer, you need something, I am here to pray with you.